This video is about Michael Jackson and his nasal surgeries. Hey, Looney Tunes! This is what Michael Jackson looks like. You look like a big fat mental patient. You'd be amazed how often I hear that. As a rhinoplasty surgeon, I feel a lot of heavy weight on my shoulders talking about this topic. Michael Jackson, you know, king of pop, um, was an incredible inspiration and continues to be for so many people. He was kind of this larger than life person, just appeared you know, in his prime to be kind of this unstoppable, uh, everlasting type of individual. And yet we all kind of started to realize at some point um, that he was fighting many demons and you know had a lot of kind of complexities in his life so this video is not meant to ridicule michael jackson his decisions about surgery or any of his um, doctors who took care of him it's really meant to be a case study into rhinoplasty surgery things that can go wrong how we sometimes look to improve on those things and also kind of reasons why you know why he may have gone down this route of having had many 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 surgeries and so keep watching watching and I'll be talking about how many surgeries, rhinoplasty surgeries in particular, I think Michael Jackson had, as well as sort of the reasons as to why he may have done um, that. So starting out with his first surgery, which seems to have been in 1979. He was uh, 21 years old at this time. And then a little backstory from what I read is that he actually had um, an injury during rehearsal and hit his nose and apparently like that was what mainly led to him wanting to get the first rhinoplasty and you know I, I think I believe this in part I think there was definitely a cosmetic component to the surgery but perhaps he did have some functional issues such as breathing problems through his nose as well so looking at the two images side by side from 1975 to then 1979 what I'm seeing is that it looks like he had an alarplasty performed which is a procedure around the the base of the nose and that's to reduce the width of the base he also had some increased projection added to his dorsum which is also called the bridge as well as some tip grafting in the tip of his nose for added projection and it looks like overall sort of a thinner appearance in general as you add some substance to the bridge and to the tip you get a narrowing effect it's almost like a tent pole as you raise that pole up the base of that tent narrows so it's the same thing with the nose again michael said that this was to help him breathe better i've had no plastic surgery on my face just my nose it helped me breathe better so i can hit higher notes potentially he did breathe better after the surgery it is possible because his alar base or the base of his nose doesn't appear to be too narrowed and with that increased projection it's possible that he may have had some improvement in his breathing he may have also had some septal deviation perhaps that was corrected that's the the central partition of the nose and maybe if that was deviated to begin with if he had that corrected he could have been doing better so we talked about also the tripod theory of the nose looking at surgery number two, this appeared to be in 1983, or you know, around that time. And now with this second rhinoplasty surgery, it looks like the tip and the bridge were further narrowed and further refined. It still looks natural, uh, still looks you know relatively acceptable, I would say, for his face, but he's already starting to have some loss of lateral nasal support. And you can see these depressions or like a groove forming at the what's called the supraalar crease. It's this crease on top of the ala, which is the side piece of the nose. This little groove that's forming on top and it's, it's as you'll see with, with the subsequent surgeries, it gets deeper and deeper. And that's because there's work being done to remove this cartilage. Um, on the inside of his nose, and that leads to loss of support. He's also developing what looks like kind of a button nose, where there's this pinching of the lower lateral cartilages in this portion of the nose. And so instead of kind of maintaining some natural divergence of those cartilages, whoever did a surgery basically just mashed them together and combined them um, and just stuck them together with some sutures. And that gives this kind of button appearance, which some people like, but it kind of loses its naturalness. There's a quote here from Dr. Stephen Hofflin, who apparently was 
at least for some of Michael surgeries, his plastic surgeon, who said that the second nose job left him with breathing difficulties and required further work. And we can see why. As you remove the cartilage of the lateral nasal wall and you get those depressions on the outside, on the inside, there's a kind of a, at least a partial collapse of the side wall of the nose. So there isn't enough stenting it open and that reduces the airflow through the nose. And then in 1984, that's when Michael Jackson sustained scalp burns during a Pepsi commercial. And many think that that then led to him getting additional surgeries, not just for the burns, but kind of more cosmetic surgeries as well. And it's interesting when you compare it to this graph that I found where it kind of tracks Michael Jackson's progression in terms of his highlights and low points throughout his career. Not related to surgery, but just overall career. You can see that in 1983, Three, at the height of Thriller, I mean, that was the highest point of his career, most success, just doing extremely well at that time. And then the burning of the hair in 1984 started to kind of take a turn for the worse in terms of his overall kind of trajectory. And then of course he had a comeback and then overall things started to fizzle out some. And I think that this trajectory of his career also then impacted the frequency and types of surgeries that he had, including on his nose. Surgery number three, so third nasal surgery for Michael Jackson, third rhinoplasty, looks like it was approximately 1986. And you can see a clear change here from 1984 to 1986 with continued lateral wall collapse. Really at this point, I think it was unlikely that this was helping his breathing and I think really causing a deterioration in his nasal breathing. And you can just see that the entire external nasal valve is just getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Basically the opening to the nose is just shrinking down. The capability of getting good airflow is dwindling as well. And then I think from 1986 to 1993, he had a series of rhinoplasties. It's hard to pinpoint exactly which year or which month they were done, but I think he had his fourth to sixth rhinoplasties in that time span, 1986 and 1993. And he probably had additional touch-ups beyond that, but that's my kind of best guess as to how many he had in that, in that time span. And there were no major sort of radical changes during this time. You can see here from 1985 to 88 to 80, 89 to 1992, you still kind of have this projected dorsum, meaning it's not collapsed yet. You have a narrowed kind of dorsum. It's narrow, but it's kind of stable in, term, in terms of how it's, how it's narrowed. And then the tip is more or less looking similar. So I think maybe there were a few touch-ups in this time span, but no major changes. And then surgery number seven, seventh rhinoplasty in 1994. You can see a clear change here there's increased rotation of the nose and that's this way so increasing the rotation will bring the tip of the nose up decreasing rotation brings the tip down projection is out further from the face and deep projection is closer to the face so it looks like here michael had an increased rotation to his nose it also just appears even more narrow and even more pointy at the tip and the bridge so further narrowing of the bridge further narrowing of the tip and an elevation or rotation of the tip as well. 1995 is when I believe Michael had an eighth rhinoplasty surgery. When you look at these pictures from 1992 to 1995, you're seeing this further narrowing as much as is possible to give him a little, little tiny tip to the nose, keeping the bridge as narrow as possible, this extreme sort of button nose type of situation and really complete loss of it, the entire lateral wall of the nose. It's almost like it doesn't exist. It almost goes from the cheek into the bridge without any transition. And you know, there are other changes occurring with Michael's face, of course, at this time. That's not the focus of this video, but there are a lot of changes with his hair. Um, there are a lot of changes with the, the color of his skin and you know his vitiligo situation and potential bleaching of the skin. A lot of eye surgery changes, jaw surgeries, cheek, 
implants, the lips narrowing down. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on, but we're gonna continue to focus on the nose. In 2000, I think Michael Jackson had a ninth rhinoplasty. And at this point, if you look at the difference between 1996 and 2000, you can see that the bridge the dorsum has really started to cave in. Eventually, you know, you mess around enough with the nose and it's just gonna give up. It's not gonna be able to maintain that support. The skin is gonna get really thin and it looks like he started to saddle and that's called a saddle nose deformity. And the base here looks even more reduced when it really, it's almost like there's no air coming in through the nose. The bridge has sunken in and you're just kind of left looking at, at his tip. And then, between 2001 to 2002, what I think happened, and also based on what I've read on the web uh, from some of his doctors in the past, is that he may have had filler placed into the nose. Most likely a hyaluronic um, acid-based filler. They were starting to get popular around that time. That was a little bit early for the HA fillers, but they existed. And I think that was used to kind of build up the bridge. I think he was hopefully advised at this point to really slow down with the nasal surgeries that potentially they could cost him the entire skin of the nose. If the skin of the nose goes, then you need skin grafting. That becomes a very big undertaking. I don't see obvious evidence that Michael had um, skin grafting or what we sometimes do, which is a, a rotational flap down from, from the forehead actually, to bring healthy skin onto the nose if that skin fails. You don't really see any obvious signs of that, but I think he did have filler placed at least into the bridge of the nose, maybe into the tip as well. And we'll play a clip here from 2003 when Michael was interviewed about potentially having had plastic surgeries, and this was his response. He says, I've had no plastic surgery on my face. Just my nose. It helped me breathe better so I can hit higher notes. I would have believed that potentially um, back in the 80s when he had, or I should say 1979 when he had his first surgery. But based on what I'm seeing, you know, after nine surgeries, I really don't think that he was breathing any better than his original nose. And then in 2005, it appears that he may have had a 10th rhinoplasty with a focus on rebuilding the bridge and the tip. I think this is potentially beyond just filler. I think he did try to have another procedure. And at this point, they may have used even rib cartilage to help reconstruct the nose. So overall, I think he's had at least 10 rhinoplasty surgeries. And, you know, after you have many of these surgeries, I guess I kind of alluded to this earlier, but the skin of the nose starts to suffer. Your ability to really create something stable and solid from a functional standpoint really starts to diminish. And the appearance, you know, really has diminishing returns after this many surgeries. And so then we come to, you know, why did Michael Jackson have all these nose surgeries? Why? 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 And just to start with a quote from, again, Dr. Hofflin, Michael Surgeon, in 2001, he, he made this quote. He said, my job is to try to make people happy. In the case of high-level entertainers, the result may not be what the average person would want. But remember, these are performers who want to create a certain image for a special reason, right? So the question is, what was the special reason? I mean, clearly, Michael Jackson had body dysmorphic disorder, but there was something beyond that, right? There was something driving him to specifically have all of these nasal surgeries and all these additional changes to his face. And to me, it's interesting to speculate on why. And when patients come to me asking for a nose job or a facelift or a lip surgery, it's, it's good to kind of feel out like what what is the underlying reason why do they want to have this done how long have they been thinking about this because the last thing i want to do is to operate on someone and have them regret having the surgery or potentially you know regret doing it um, in myself so it's, sometimes it's good to ask why and so you know now we have a little bit more insight into you know michael's life and 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 reasons why so three different potential reasons as to why i think he had and maybe it was a combination of all these things, you know, I don't know for sure. I think one is his battle with vitiligo, which is an autoimmune condition. And as you guys know, I have my own autoimmune condition, alopecia areata, which destroys hair follicles. In vitiligo, the body is actually attacking uh, the pigment in the skin. And so you start to lose some of the pigment 
and you get these like little areas of pigment loss and eventually it can kind of spread all over. And so I think Michael was battling this um, condition, this autoimmune type of condition. And it was kind of, you know, making him look more and more white. And I think at some point he probably did some bleaching to kind of even out the tone. And you can see signs of, you know, the hair getting straighter, certain features like the lips getting thinner, the nose getting more narrow and projected, certain Caucasian features that he was taking on. And maybe he felt that he kind of had to go sort of all the way to, you know, satisfy that kind of transformation, which was partially out of his control, of course. Number two is I think he potentially wanted to be less like his family. He talked openly about uh, how he would get, you know, laughed at, made fun of by his brothers. He had a very tumultuous relationship with his father. He practiced us with a belt in his hand. And if you miss a step, expect to be... Uh... And maybe this was kind of like an F you to his family to say, I'm going to be different and I'm going to just do whatever the hell I want to do. And then number three, which I find to be the most intriguing explanation, is that he actually was enamored by the character of Peter Pan. And as you guys know, he built out this Neverland, almost like a theme park, which was, I guess, part of his house and whatnot, and kind of shared it with a lot of children and, you know, had, um, you know, that whole thing going on. And to him, I think Peter Pan was like a representation of youth. And it was the youth that was stolen from him uh, when he was a child and had, was essentially forced to perform. So I think he wanted to kind of relive that youth and he wanted to be more like Peter Pan. Peter Pan to me uh, represents something that's very special in my heart. You know, he represents youth, childhood, never growing up, magic, flying, everything I think that children and wonderment and magic, what it's all about. And to me, I just have never ever grown out of loving that or thinking that is very special. Do you identify with him? Totally. You don't want to grow up? No, I am Peter Pan. No, you're not. You're Michael Jackson. I'm Peter Pan, my heart. And if you look at an image of Peter Pan and you look at the nose and you look at that sunken in bridge and you look at that upturned tip, that narrow tip, and even the way the eyes are shaped and the mouth is shaped, you start to really see, you know, what maybe Michael was, was striving for. And Michael once said, I'm never pleased with anything. I'm a perfectionist. It's part of who I am. So I think part of what drove him um, and what inspired him to continue to create all this incredible music and perfect his dance moves and all this, you know, beautiful stuff that he brought into the world was probably some of the same tendencies that also drove him to do all these surgeries.